So I'd like to start today's lecture with a quote, and here it goes. Maybe it's my fault. Maybe I led you to believe it was easy when it wasn't. Maybe I made you think my highlights started at the free throw line and not the gym. Maybe I made you think that every shot I took was a game winner, that my game was built on flash and not fire. Maybe it's my fault that you didn't see that failure gave me strength, that my pain was my motivation. Maybe I led you to believe that basketball was a God-given gift and not something I worked for every single day of my life. Maybe I destroyed the game, or maybe you're just making excuses. And that is the great Michael Jordan, a quote from Michael Jordan speaking to a group of basketball players at a basketball camp. It's actually from a Nike Jordan commercial from the early 2000s. Uh, maybe I'll upload it to Blackboard so you could take a look at it if you're a basketball or Michael Jordan fan. But I want to start with that quote because every time I read chapter two of Outliers, the 10,000 hour rule, I, I think of Michael Jordan's words. And Michael Jordan's words, I feel like, embody and sum up everything that this chapter is about, which is, as far as success is concerned, again, back to Malcolm Gladwell's argument, it's not just the innate talent, as he's going to refer to it in this chapter, it's not just the innate talent or ability or genes of an individual. It's outside factors like their environment, their surroundings, and as the focus of this chapter is concerned, also the amount of hard work, practice, and dedication that you give to a particular craft. And so something Michael Jordan was always known for throughout his career was his work ethic. And if you're a Michael Jordan fan or a basketball fan, um, you can find countless stories of, of Jordan's work ethic, anecdotes about how he would be um, up late at night practicing while everyone else was sleeping is a pretty famous cliche one. But again, back to the quote I started with, I think what that quote is saying is it's easy for us to see greatness and not understand or see the path that led to it or the amount of time, effort, energy that an individual put into mastering their craft before that greatness was achieved. And in Michael Jordan's case, he obviously had God-given ability and talent, but it was, it was the combination of that talent with his preparation that allowed him to be the greatest basketball player of all time. And I know some of you youngsters will disagree with me and say LeBron is the GOAT, but if you, if you want to do some research, watch The Last Dance, which came out recently. Um, during the pandemic, which is a great documentary on Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls. But I digress. Um, just some further complimentary uh, viewing and reading if you're interested. So on to chapter two, the 10,000 the hour rule. This is probably the most famous chapter of all of Malcolm Gladwell's books. Um, and the whole idea of 10,000 hours does not come from Malcolm Gladwell, but it comes from a study by a man named Erickson. I just want to get his full name correct. By K. Anders Erickson, to be exact, from the early 1990s, um, where he studied violinists at um, Berlin's Elite Academy of Music. And so the whole idea of 10,000 hours, it comes from this study done by K. Anders Erickson, which is the highlight of this chapter. And as far as our rhetorical appeals are concerned, this would be one of the appeals to logos that Malcolm Gladwell presents early on in the chapter, is this study by Kay Anders Erickson focusing on violinists at Berlin's Elite Academy of Music. So you can expect a question on Friday's quiz to be related to that study. And so definitely a focus area uh, for this chapter. Now, um, back to the popularity of, of this chapter in this book. Um, again, like I said, I think this is probably his most famous chapter that he's ever written. Um, 
the whole idea of 10,000 hours. Um, we hear everywhere in pop culture now. Um, if you're a fan of music like I am, um, oftentimes I'll just be randomly listening to music and in the lyrics of a song, I'll hear a reference to 10,000 hours. And I'm a huge hip hop fan. And there have been um, several hip hop songs I've listened to over recent years where um, artists are, are using the phrase or the term 10,000 hours in the lyrics. And again, they're referring to the amount of time and effort and practice that you need to put in um, in order to master a craft. And so, again, I think um, part of what I really enjoy about this book and what's appealing to the average reader is just you're able to connect and relate a lot of the ideas, the claims, and the references to the world around you. And um, I, I think you see Gladwell as a writer attempting to reach a wider audience in that way with examples that are relatable, that are familiar, that again, a wide audience um, is able um, to connect to. And so as far as Gladwell as a writer, I, I feel like he's trying to, re again, reach a wide audience here. Everyone from scholars to the average person who maybe just reads for enjoyment. And you can tell in the way that he writes, the type of language that he uses, it's very accessible to a wide audience. He doesn't um, bog his writing down with excessive jargon and technical terms and language and um, scholarly vocabulary. Um, I heard Gladwell in an inter interview one time say that his goal oftentimes is to talk about complicated topics and subjects, scientific, scholarly topics and subjects. He's trying to write about those topics at a high school reading level. And again, he is just trying to um, reach a wider audience in saying that. So um, other focus areas for the chapter is, again, um, Gladwell is going to give us some uh, more familiar examples um, of individuals who have received extraordinary opportunities that combined with their ability and talent allowed them to succeed at the highest levels. So the first person Gladwell is going to introduce is Bill Joy. And that's probably the one um, example or person in this chapter maybe you won't be familiar with, but Bill Joy is one of the greatest computer programmers of all time. Um, his computer programming um, is still used today. It allows us to access the internet and millions of computers around the world are still um, using his software. So. Um, he will use Bill Joy as an example of an individual who's received extraordinary opportunities and was able to capitalize on them in his path to success. And then from there, he's going to give us two more examples that are a bit more familiar, those being uh, Bill Gates and the Beatles. So if you're a music fan, if you like the Beatles, um, I think you'll really enjoy this chapter because we get a really interesting backstory on how the Beatles were able to accumulate their 10,000 hours of practice in mastering the craft of their music. And then we get a really interesting, but maybe more obvious um, backstory with Bill Gates and some of the um, great opportunities that he received in combination with his innate talent and intelligence and ability. Um, those opportunities he received being highlighted in the chapter as being key components in him and his path to success. So as far as focus areas for the chapter um, that will relate to Friday's quiz is be prepared to answer some questions related to Erickson's study at Berlin's Elite Academy of Music, um, questions related to Bill Joy, Bill Gates, and the Beatles, and um, their background stories and their opportunities that they received. And then at the end of the chapter, Gladwell is going to give us a, a list of the 75 richest, wealthiest people in the world. And we're going to find out that they have a common characteristic in their background stories as well um, that relates to um, a claim or an example that Gladwell gave in chapter one that's similar to the advantage that the youth hockey players in Canada experienced. So to sum things up, a big part of 
why I enjoy sharing this book with my students is because I just feel like you gain a lot of knowledge and insight about success that relates to you as a college student. And I think one of the most important things to realize as a college student is that you have all of these great opportunities around you. And it's a matter of whether or not you're able to see them, to become aware of them, and then finally to capitalize on them. And so I think it's really important to understand, again, that um, you have so many great opportunities around you, whether it be the classes that you're currently taking, which you can consider to be the practice on your way um, towards your career path. Um, it could be the opportunities to get involved in organizations around you, student organizations, et cetera. Um, those are great opportunities to help yourself become involved in a community, in a campus community. Going back to the idea of community from the introduction in which um, was a focus of Ron Finley's TED Talk that I had you watch leading into today, which I hope you enjoyed. And again, back to being able to just relate so much of the world around you to the themes and claims in this book is just, um, I'm able to connect uh, the topics, um, the claims in this book to so many other things that I've seen and read over the years. Um, one of those being Ron Finley's uh, TED Talk. So um, again, I, I think a big takeaway from this book for you guys as students that's applicable to your, your current lives is just being aware of how important it is to capitalize on opportunities around you and to just be aware of the opportunities that surround you. And then along with that, just understanding how to ask for help, how to navigate systems, how to navigate um, the, the college experience as preparation for navigating um, the professional world that you will enter after it. It's so important. One of the most important parts of navigating those systems is understanding how to ask for help and understanding um, who the right people around you are to ask for help. Networking. Networking is so important when you're a college student, as well as the professional world once you, you leave college, is making connections, not just with um, other fellow students, which is so important too, but making connections with your professors, with your advisors. Sorry, I got the automatic lights in, in my office. I'm not trying to set the mood or anything, but <laughs> just kidding. Um, no, just um, becoming connected with um, important people around you that could potentially help you. Again, um, connect, networking um, during your college years is really important because um, individuals that you meet, whether it be professors, advisors, mentors, etc., those could be your references further down the line that you might need when you apply for jobs later on. Or um, maybe it could just be finding a mentor in somebody around you that can um, make you aware again of um, how you can best maximize your, your years of college and how you can capitalize on opportunities that maybe you didn't even realize were there. So again, um, I hope as a college student, you find this book um, insightful or, or helpful even maybe or inspiring as far as um, how you can better set yourself up for success, how you can be better aware of the environment that surrounds you and how it might be affecting your success, whether it's helping it or maybe um, interfering with, with success. You know, I think, again, another important part of being a college student is surrounding yourself with the right people. And that's one of the best things I can encourage any young person to do is just to be mindful of the company that you keep, because ultimately you will be influenced one way or another by those that are are close to you and those that surround you. So just surrounding yourself with people that are positive, that are motivated, that are going to influence you to be the best version of yourself and where you're influencing those around you in the same way. Um, I think that's really uh, important as far as individual success is concerned. So I'll leave it there. Um, as far as Friday's quiz, again, you can expect questions related to the focus areas for the chapter, um, those being Erickson's, Erickson's study, excuse me, um, Bill Joy, Bill Gates, the Beatles, and then at the end of the chapter, the list of the 75 
richest, wealthiest people in the world. So um, as far as responding to those quiz questions, I think we did a much better job on the last quiz citing the text. Make sure you use the proper MLA format and that you really work on framing your quotes. And again, I gave uh, resources to help you with that in a previous class email. Um, I, I refer to some pages from They Say, I Say to help you with citing the text and framing your quotes. And I gave you a page from the Purdue Al, um, MLA format guide as far as in-text citations are concerned. So please refer to that email and those resources to help you with answering quiz questions. Okay, um, enjoy the rest of your day. Hope you have a great week and good luck on Friday's quiz.